Hello, and welcome to the Wine Enthusiast Podcast, your serving of wine trends and passionate people beyond the bottle. I'm Lauren Buzio, the managing editor here at Wine Enthusiast, and in this episode, we're taking a detour into the delicious world of craft beer. IPAs remain all the rage in the beer world, but not all IPAs are created equal. To celebrate National IPA Day on August 6th, beer editor John Hall, an industry icon and OG of the American craft beer scene, Ken Grossman of Sierra Nevada Brewing, talk about all things hoppy, musing on the style's history in the States, the beauty and versatility of the style, and why hazy and wet hop selections, or those that use fresh hop flowers as opposed to dried options, currently reign supreme. So get ready for your mouth to water as we explore the wonderful world of hop-fueled heaven. There's a lot of folks who are still coming into craft beer, who are still trying to uh, experience it even for the first time. And and hops, I think, still are a hurdle for people to, to jump over. You've obviously been making hoppy beers for the better part of four decades now. I'm curious if you can just sort of give us a little bit of background on what hops are and what they do for beer. Certainly. So hops are a uh, a flower that grows on a, a bine, not a vine, but um, uh, bines are, are what uh, um, hops are. And they grow up a trellis and, and um, hops will grow to roughly 20 feet in height on uh, on a string. Um they're growing up, at least in the United States, um, primarily in the northern latitudes. Uh, Oregon, Washington, Idaho is where most of American hops are growing, and, and Washington being the number one state. Idaho uh, just took second place, and Oregon is third. Um, and then there are some attempts to bring back commercial production in um, places like New York and you know, some Colorado and screwing across Michigan. Uh, straight across the country, but as far as the primary production, it's up in those areas uh, because a hop needs a, a, a fairly long length of day in order to to grow well. The sort of flowers or cones that uh, grow on the plant are what brewers um, use and desire for flavoring and bittering beer, and they contain a, a, a wide range of uh, compounds, both uh, bitter acids, uh, alpha and beta acids, um, primarily the alpha acid is what's measured, um, and then a whole range of aromatic compounds or oils in the hops. And hops traditionally fell into sort of two categories. There was the hops growing just for their bitter flavor and character, and the uh, the bitterness does a number of things in beer besides balancing out the sweetness from the malt. Um, the alpha acids actually contain uh, natural antibacterial static properties, and, and they've actually, in recent years, found use in other industries for that antibacterial static property just to keep mold and bacteria and wild yeast from uh, surviving in other products. So that's uh, sort of why hops were. Uh, discovered as a beer ingredient, both from their flavoring, but also because they did help preserve the beer. Yeah. Um, and then there's a whole range of aromatic oils that are produced uh, in the hop. And um, there's literally hundreds of compounds that go into uh, that mix of, of aroma. And the uh, original classification was you'd have a, a bittering hop that was added uh, early during the, the kettle boil. And it would impart that um, alpha acid and um, contribute to, to the, the bitter character. And then there was a class of hops that were commonly referred to as aroma hops. And, and uh, some people um, discussed them as sort of the, the noble aroma hops growing in Europe, uh, Czechoslovakia and Germany. And so hops were in these two classifications. And um, they were uh, selected again for their either level of bitterness or, or type and level of aroma compounds. In the United States, um, historically, um, there's been a, a long, long uh, hop growing industry, and it used to stretch down into California and other uh, areas. And as I mentioned, uh, New York and Michigan and places like that, turn of the yeah. century, grew hops. Most of those were brought over from um, Europe and um, 
there were some wild hops also found uh, growing out in the countryside. The American hops for many, many years were considered to be really only a bittering quality or bittering value. They they didn't have some of the, uh, I guess, more refined uh, in some brewers' minds aromas that some of the German and Czechoslovakian hops had. And so we pretty much grew one variety in the U.S., and it was called Cluster, and that was um, 80 or 90 percent of the U.S. hop crop um, in the in the turn of the century, probably into the late 70s. And then there were some breeding programs. Um, Oregon State had a breeding program and, and some other um, universities did as well as some private farms. And we started to introduce other varieties, both for bittering and then uh, aroma hops were being developed. Um, and hops like the Cascade came out uh, in, uh, I think it was developed in the 70s, I think didn't really find favor with brewers just because it was a, a pretty unique aroma profile. Uh, had pine and citrus and, and other qualities that most um, brewers uh, weren't used to. Um, and most of our brewing industry back in those days, uh, the brewers were trained in Germany and had a sort of a, a, a different perception of what a, a aroma hop should smell like. But Cascade was introduced, and then later uh, Centennial and, and other varieties that had uh, unique and, and differentiating aromas. And that was sort of at the forefront of the craft brewing startup. Um, we featured Cascade as, as the hop in our pale ale and um, introduced a pretty you know, distinctive and different aroma profile to that beer compared to what most uh, lager uh, beers had at the time. Well, and that's sort of the interesting thing. So 40 years ago, when Sierra Nevada started, I know pale ale wasn't the first beer that you made, right? It was it was stout? Well, we brewed a test batch of stout uh, was our very first batch, but two days okay. later we started brewing pale ale. So pale ale was um, our, um, our flagship brand, and it was intended to be our flagship brand from the beginning. But uh, yeah, batch one, I made five barrels of stout just to sort of test out the, the new equipment and figure out how to brew on it. Um, after scaling up from five-gallon batches, we were scaling up to 300-gallon uh, batches and, and um, figured stout would uh, sort of hide some of the mistakes we might make on that first <laughs> batch of beer. But in 1980, though, launching a brewery with Pale Ale as a, as a flagship, that was a risk, yeah, so the industry in 1980s is, uh, I guess, dramatically different than it is today with um, roughly 8,000 breweries that were uh, in operation today. Back then, there were 43 independent brewing companies, and um, between 1978 and 1982, um, six of us uh, sort of entered the business, and, and we had really been the the first generation of new breweries to get into the U.S. market really since Prohibition. Um, after Prohibition ended, uh, and the breweries that uh, had figured out how to survive being shut down for uh, all those years, um, you know, started back up again. But really, there hadn't been new entrants into the marketplace um, really since the, the craft um, movement started in the late 70s. Most of the beer industry at that point, you know, the 43 brewers um, and besides the, the six little ones, um, uh, they were producing really one style of beer. It was, you know, a, a lager style, um, fairly light, um, not very um, full of hops or malt, not a lot of character, and, and um, you know, everybody was really making similar type products. And then when the Craft Brewers started up, I, I think, um, um, probably with with the vision of uh, what Fritz Maytag had done with Anchor, which was to produce a distinctively different kind of beer because, um, you know, as a really small business, you, you couldn't compete against the uh, national, you know, Anheuser-Busch and Miller and Coors and Strohs and Pabst and, and those brands that were um, you know, large, large brewing companies. Um, it really wasn't a viable business to, to try to you know, match them for style and price. And, and so uh, 
the only way you know we realized we could survive would be to produce something that was pretty distinctively different um, and to command a premium price. Was there was there a clamoring for that though? I mean, you mentioned hops imparting bitterness into a beer, and bitter is such a tough word to sell to people. Yeah. Um, how did you overcome that in those early days to to convince people who were used to drinking sweeter right. or less flavor or where hops were, were basically a foreign ingredient? Yeah, so um, just, I guess, for a, a reference point, um, you know, beers in America at the time were somewhere in the um, 10 bitterness unit uh, range and there's a uh, a way you can measure that alpha acid and and it's uh, called an international bitterness unit or an mm-hmm. IBU and um, the uh, American brewing industry had been slowly uh, reducing the bittering levels in in beer for many many years um, probably back in the 40s and 50s you might find uh, a, a number of lager beers uh, in this country that were in the 20 bitterness unit range and over time um, that number went down and I talked to a, a, a brewmaster at one of the major breweries um, back in the early 80s and, and he had been tracking sort of the the whole industry's slow, uh, reduction of, of bittering value, and, and he said about every year, starting around I don't know, the late 60s or late 70s, most breweries would drop about one bitterness unit per year. Wow! And so it went from being somewhere in the 20s to um, you know 18, 17, 16, 15, uh, and there was at least one major brewer back in the mid 80s that was still around 15 or 16 bitterness units. Um, and uh, they would watch each other. And so when one would go down to uh, 11, the other one would, you know, maybe drop down to 11 or 12, and then it'd go down to 10, and then the other one would go down to you know 10 or 11. And, and so they sort of just followed each other down. How low can you um, go? And yeah. It, yeah, I mean, it got to a point, and, and I don't have uh, the numbers uh, in my mind exactly, but um, there were some major lager beers that were down in the six range. Um, and uh, I think at some point they started to get back up a, a little bit. Um, so now probably somewhere in the you know, 10, you know, 10 bitterness unit range. Well, we introduced our pale ale. We were at 38 bitterness units mm. and um, we still, still are today. So the, the uh, bitterness level has stayed the same since we, we opened the brewery. Um, but if you went to Europe, there were lots of beers that were in the thirties. And um, so I, I think, you know, it, it's not that um, people don't appreciate um, beers and particularly today. I mean, there's lots of beers that are in the 50, 60, 70, 80 bitterness unit range. And even uh, higher. Yeah. Bigger IPAs. Um, so it's not as if uh, that level uh, is a total turnoff to the drinker. It, it, yes, it was different than most uh, lager drinkers were used to drinking at the time. But if the beer has got balance and, and um, you know, balance really helps to make the bitterness um, enjoyable. And so having the right amount of uh, malt sweetness and body and, and um, you know, other characteristics in the beer uh, can allow a, a, a 40 bitterness unit beer to taste uh, refreshing and pleasing and and uh, enjoyable. Having a you know a thin um, beer that that uh, doesn't balance out a 50 or 60 um, bitterness uh, level uh, can be a turnoff and, and uh, can be definitely a, a hard. Um, drink for a, a, a person who's not used to, to you know, hoppy beers. Um, I, I tend to, to think, uh, you know, we started in 1980, and that was right about the point where um, people were starting to appreciate, um, you know, stronger and more sort of traditional styles of foods. You know, there were bakeries opening up with, um, you know, whole grain breads. There were coffee roasters starting to produce um, more flavorful 
coffees. There were small artisan cheese plants um, making you know, cheese with a lot of character. Uh, so I, I think there was a percentage of the American population who uh, could appreciate um, more fully flavored foods and drinks. And um, so I, I think that sort of went hand in hand. Uh, obviously, it did not appeal to the masses at the time or, or that wide of a range of beer drinker. Um, but the people who really uh, enjoyed that nuanced balance of you know a fair amount of hops with a good malt backbone could really um, get to love something like our pale ale. But it was at, th- at that time you know sort of a few and far between. Um, you know you, you would uh, I'd go to a tasting and uh, if it was just sort of a, a general beer drinker who was used to drinking light lager beers and you gave them our pale ale it was like a big shock to them. So plenty of people hated it, um, but there were there there were a percentage of people who really enjoyed that um, um, you know balance of hops and, and malt. But even still today, I mean, the the craft beer market in the U.S. is about 13 percent of the overall beer market right now. So we still have 87 or so percent of folks who are still drinking you know, some of the larger American lagers that are out there. So if, if you put a Sierra Nevada pale ale at 38 bittering units uh, in, in, in front of somebody today, what would you ask them to look for? What would you ask them to, to try to experience taste and aroma wise to highlight the benefits of hops in a beer? You know, our, our pale ale at the time was, was certainly a, um, you know, revolutionary, um, you know, unique, distinctively different beer than the, the mainstream beers for sure. Today, it's actually not considered to be an extreme beer compared to, to most of what craft brewers are, are brewing. Um, so, you know, I think the acceptance today is much higher with the, the general beer drinker. But I would, um, you know, ask them to appreciate it for balanced malt and hop character. It's, it's not really an extremely hoppy beer uh, in the scheme of things. And I think if you've got a, a bit of an open mind and an open palate, um, you should be able to enjoy the, the, the nuances of what the, the hop uh, brings to the, both the flavor and the aroma uh, of the beer. Uh, and, you know, there's a, a place for a light, well-made lager beer, certainly, and, and um, you know, on a hot day, you know, with some foods, um, you know, those lighter styles work well. But a beer like our pale ale um, also has a, a great place alongside food, and, and uh, you know, I think there's uh, a lot of balance and appreciation you can have for a beer like our pale ale and not have to be a, a hop head to be able to enjoy it. Need a break from the news? We're very excited to tell you about an all-new podcast from our partner site, Thirsty Nest, the first wine and spirits registry for the modern couple. This podcast is called Can I Buy You a Drink? And on it, founder Jackie Strom will interview wine and wedding industry up-and-comers about their very own meet-cute stories and their path to finding the one. It's a dreamy break from all the scary headlines that will warm your cold, cold heart. So check out Can I Buy You a Drink? from the Thirsty Nest team on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, or any other podcast platform you prefer. One of the things that we've seen in the last few years is the emergence of the juicy or the hazy style of IPA, which uses uh, a significant amount of hops, but rather than imparting bitterness uh, because of when the hops are added, it it does have more of an aroma um, or or, uh, flavor profile rather than uh, the sensation of, of, of bitterness. Um, do you think that that's helped grow the category? Uh, it, it certainly has. So the, uh, and I think, um, you know, the unfiltered or hazy um, styles of beer do a, a number of things. And, and, you know, part of it is the way the hops are used and, and a beer like our uh, easy little thing uses a lot of hops and a lot of different varieties, um, but we use um, a minimal amount up front during the um, boiling process, so we're not trying to extract much bitterness. And we use most of the hops actually during the fermentation process just to extract those oils. 
but also I think that the hazy style, at least um, our way of brewing it, also contains a lot of things like oats and wheat that really help on that soft um, balance on the palate. So they're uh, very easy and, and round in flavor, and um, they use the term juicy. So the, the juiciness comes a bit from how the hops are used, but also from the, the grist, um, the grain bill. Utilizing oats uh, gives a real roundness to the palate, and so it really helps to um, lessen the impact of uh, hot bitterness. That, that There's still certainly um, some hot bitterness, but it's really well balanced by the, uh, the grist bill, um, so it doesn't come across or isn't perceived as being um, very bitter, uh, even though it does contain a lot of hops. We've seen a evolution of the pale ale and the IPA in America uh, over the last 40 or so years. And, and your brewery has been at the very forefront of that, I think, for most of the innovations that have happened. I know you spend a lot of time uh, talking with researchers and you, you obviously have some very talented people on your staff who are solely dedicated to the exploration of hops. Where do you think that this ingredient is going in beer? So hop breeding has has been done uh, with conventional breeding methods for many, many years. Um, There are still people who travel the world looking for wild uh, hops to use as um, part of the breeding stock of of new varieties. Um, And so there's there's quite a science of uh, research around breeding. And most of the breeding groups literally make thousands and thousands of crosses uh, a year. And they've been doing this uh, in some fashion for many, many years uh, until craft brewers came along. Um, Many of the varieties that were cross-pollinated and and developed really didn't have a home because, as I mentioned, even the Cascade, which was sort of the very first uh, American commercialized aroma hop, um, brewers uh, of the time um, back in the, the late 60s and 70s rejected that those kinds of hop uh, aromas because they were uh, foreign to them. They were used to using um, you know, the German or the Czechoslovakian saws hop or, or German Holler Tower or, or some of these hops that have very mild uh, aroma profiles. And so, uh, you know, there's been a complete uh, sort of uh, hop-growing revolution um, because craft brewers want hops that have a lot of unique aromas and characters. And, you know, we like hops that have a rose note to them or pineapple or mango or um, there's just a a whole world of uh, aromas that can be developed through breeding uh, that the hops naturally produce these compounds. And so we've got a pretty sophisticated R&D lab with uh, quite a few gas chromatographs and um, sift ports. And and so we work pretty closely with hop breeders and we'll we'll send folks up to Yakima quite a few times a year uh, to go meet with hop breeders. And we we do some of these collaborations with growers in Europe and Australia and New Zealand as well. And so we're looking for hops that have distinctive character nuances to them. And there's re- really just an unlimited amount of, of variety that uh, can be uh, developed, aroma varieties that can be developed um, to uh, breeding. And so I think sort of the sky is the limit with the, with the breeding of hops. And um, we've got dozens that are always sort of in our lab and in our pilot brewery um, that are being um, bred and, and uh, developed. And if we find one we love, we'll um, work with the, uh, the farmers and we'll plant uh, uh, a few acres and then brew some beers with them and um, try to decide if it's uh, a variety we think that's got um, you know, a future. And then next year we'll add more acreage. And um, so it's a ongoing process and collaboration with um, farmers and breeders um, and then you know, trying to develop beers around uh, those unique hops. So we're always excited to, to experiment with new varieties, and there's, um, the growers now are really um, uh, into developing these new aroma varieties, and, and uh, 
as I mentioned in the beginning of, of the talk, that um, uh, you know, the U.S. used to be 80% or more uh, cluster variety and supply pretty much only bittering hops to the uh, U.S. and other um, international brewers who bought American hops. Today, uh, it's over half aroma hops being grown in the U.S., and most of those aroma hops are very distinctive aroma hops that have uh, you know, just a, a wide range of uh, unique uh, flavors. You know, that there's been um, Amarillo, I mean, there's been, I'd say, a half a dozen pretty unique hops that have really taken the marketplace by storm um, and have uh, displaced. Cascade became the number one American aroma hop a few years back, and now mm-hmm. Sestra and um, other new varieties coming down the, the pike. So it's a, a pretty great time to be a brewer as well as, I think, uh, overall a hop grower as far as just the openness and uh, marketplace for innovation in hop growing and, and brewing. And certainly it's a good time to be a beer drinker as well. Yep, yep. We uh, we're really uh, have just such a wider palette of beers available uh, than we did uh, just a few years ago just because of the, uh, the unique character of hops that have been developed. Ken Grossman of Sierra Nevada Brewing Company, thanks so much for taking the time to talk with me on the podcast today. It's been my pleasure, and uh, happy beer drinking. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Wine Enthusiast Podcast. I don't know about you, but National IPA Day or not, I am definitely ready to crack a fragrant, flavorful, fresh-hopped IPA right about now. There's been incredible evolution and experimentation in the world of hops over the last few decades, and therefore so much to taste and explore as it pertains to the different aroma, flavor, and textural additions each unique variety can offer to a final beer. Be sure to visit winemag.com slash podcast for links to learn more about beer's beautiful floral ingredient. From trendy aromatic selections to classic bittering varieties, as well as current reviews of America's favorite craft beer category. Subscribe to the Wine Enthusiast podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you find podcasts. And if you like today's episode, we'd love to read your review and hear what you think. And hey, why not tell your wine and beer loving friends to check us out too? You can also drop us a line at podcast at winemag.com. For more wine and beer reviews, recipes, guides, deep dives, and stories, visit Wine Enthusiast online at winemag.com and connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Wine Enthusiast. The Wine Enthusiast podcast is produced by Lauren Buzio and Jenny Groza. Until next episode, cheers. Cheers.